<laughs> okay. <laughs> Just to confirm, recording in progress. Um, so today's topic is um, essentially the biliary system. We've talked a fair bit about the liver over the last few fortnights. Um, and I did a talk recently, an ultrasound training course, and I prepared some slides and stuff for that. So I thought I'd use those to guide the sort of case-based discussion around biliary disease, which does mean this talk is probably not going to be great for people listening just to the audio. Um, so I'll sort of leave the slides up on the screen and screen share and um, we can, uh, you can just look at your phone as you want. And hopefully the images will be good enough quality that they'll, they'll come through on the screen. Um, but to start with, I wanted just to talk about the, a little bit of biliary physiology. We talked about liver anatomy and the um, direction of bile flow through the liver. Um, but what is bile made up of predominantly? Bile salts. Yep, good. Cholesterol. Excellent. That's pigment. Phosphor Phos Phos something and something else. <laughs> 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 Good, yeah. Um, uh, definitely something else. Is it basic or acidic? Uh, basic, isn't it? Good. Yeah. Excellent. Like a, yeah. Excellent. Um, can anyone tell me what dictates the um, amount of bile being produced, which then dictates the rate of bile flow? Cholecystic well, ironing does one thing, like the contraction. Good, yeah. And there's another one that does something else. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's elaborated. <laughs> well, you finished your exam now, Pooja. You don't have to remember this stuff. Oh, I did very, I am very, uh, did very poorly on the orals. I froze. Oh, no. Don't um, talk about that. <laughs> oh, shame. Well, next, there's always next year. And like the whole idea of memberships is that you've learned a lot. And I'm sure you learned a lot in the study process. It's not about yeah. passing. Yeah, yeah. as satisfying as passing is as speaking from experience sitting fellowships twice was very beneficial for me <laughs> um uh yes yeah, so you're right so um cholecystokinin is the main cause of the big gallbladder contraction where the gallbladder empties what stimulates cholecystokinin secretion that Good. But yep. um, even if, yep. when the particles come to the duodenum, then good. Or is it stomach? I think it's the stomach. No, duodenum. You're right. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So as soon as those fatty acids hit the duodenum, um, amino acids can trigger it as well, and duodenal stretch as well. But it's predominantly fat that triggers it. Um, so cholecystokinin causes the big gallbladder contractions postprandially. Does anybody know what the name of the hormone is that will cause the bellows-like fluctuations? Because sometimes the gallbladder just pumps itself even during fasting. Oh, I don't know. I'd be guessing. Sorry. Starts with an M. Let's guess. Oh, that was not my guess. Anyway. <laughs> Someone else, please. <laughs> M-O? Mo. Motilin. Good. Ah, yeah. yes. Very good. So I like motilin because well it's motility. It's like it kind of is self-describing a little bit. So motilin is responsible for the little bellows, like contractions in fasting periods, and then cholecystokinin does the predominant big gallbladder squeeze. Um, so that's, that is has a big impact on bile flow and storage in the gallbladder but what actually stimulates gall uh, um not necessarily gallbladder but bile secretion from the hepatocytes the kind of amount of bile that's being produced there's two two things that drive bile production Should I tell you? It's actually a really tricky question. Um, so the bile salt production. So if you've got more bile salt, 
you will produce more bile. So bile salts are really osmotic and they draw fluid into the um, canaliculi and then into the common bile duct and gallbladder to produce more flow. So that's kind of the theory behind ursifolk or ursodeoxycholic acid. So we're increasing bile acid secretion, which then draws fluid into the bile, which then it um, leads to increased bile flow. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's cool. Okay, and then the other thing that drives bile production is glutathione. Do you remember about glutathione we were talking about in our detoxification talk? Yes, everybody. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you remember what it is? It's an antioxidant. Good, excellent. So glutathione is very osmotic as well. And this is what I love when you're reading stuff and two different bits of knowledge that you have in two different compartments in your brain that come together and you're like, oh. So we know glutathione's role in detoxification is really important. Um, glutathione's role in bile flow and bile production is that it's similar to bile salts. If you've got more glutathione, you've got faster bile flow. What glutathione does is splits into three amino acids, cysteine, glycine, and glutamate. I cheated. I was looking then. Don't think you need to remember that. Um, so three amino acids. And the enzyme that converts glutathione to these three amino acids is GGT. Mm -hmm. So it's on the membrane of the bile canaliculi, the GGT converts glutathione into those three amino acids, which actually then triples its osmotic capacity. So when you've got a requirement to increase flow of bile, GGT is going to go up because it wants to increase that bile flow. So glutathione and bile acids are the two things that you can modulate to increase bile flow in the liver. Excellent. Okay. Is that why GGT is high when there's anorexia? Because anorexia. the gallbladder will become bigger as well. So is that like it's more produced and then stores and that's why the gallbladder then becomes big? It's a really interesting point. I'm not sure. I haven't read the causality. Like I wouldn't be comfortable saying, yeah, that's what caused that. But yeah, interesting. Is GG2 elevated with fasting? I think, of... I think I have something like this in my head. It, I could have made that up, but I yeah. think there's something like that in my it's head. Not, yeah, I don't have it. I, I can't remember reading that, but then I've forgotten most things. So it could be. I will double check and get back on that. Okay. Thanks, Rita. Um, it took me a while okay. to connect down. No, sorry, but glutathione's involved in the detoxification of paracetamol in cats, isn't it? It is very much so. Glutathione's one of the only detoxification mechanisms for the for the majority of toxins both endogenous sex and an exogenous toxin it's it's our best we call it thiol donors isn't it more n or cysteine that you're thinking about jeff um but it's probably both uh, I mean, glutath glutathione is the master antioxidant for detoxification. Yeah, so not, I don't think Jeff's referring to um, supplemental glutathione. I think he's talking about within the hepatocytes. Right, yeah. Within the sort of detoxification process. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff. Um, and N-acetylcysteine and SAMe both act as thiol donors to amplify the the capacity of glutathione to increase glutathione capacity yeah. in detoxification. So they both work in the same way. Can you supplement, do you supplement glutathione, Matt? Um, I, I sometimes, um, mm -hmm. the human humans do a lot. Um, I, we, we go after more superoxide dimutase with herbal medicine, but yes, Yes, definitely. I've used glutathione, um, as do the border nutritionists um, sometimes as well. But yeah, some, that's when you'd be using SAMI or um, N acetylcysteine in certain cases to, to amplify the glutathione. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to review the bile anatomy because 
uh, it was a bit embarrassingly late in my training program that I really understood bioflow and where the gallbladder sits in the biliary tree. So I was sort of thinking, how do you take out a gallbladder when everything's plugging into the top of it and you just take it out? Where does the bile go? So everybody else probably already knows this, but I'm going to put it up just in case anybody's as slow as I was. Okay. So these parts, can everybody see my cursor? Mm. Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Let's see if this works. These parts? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Okay. Awesome. All these parts are in the liver. So the, it's like a big tree and the branches of the tree are the canaliculi and then they go into bile ducts, intrahepatic bile ducts. And then they drain into the cystic duct, which is the part of the bile duct, which is intrahepatic. And then as soon as that bile duct gets extrahepatic, it's called the common bile duct. But the gallbladder is almost like a, um, like a little um, diverticuli, essentially, of the biliary tree. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. it, sits off, it sits off the side. And obviously it's sitting up within the liver and it provides that bolus assistance for fat digestion that's needed postprandially. But as long as there's adequate bile flow through these canaliculi, intrahepatic bile ducts, cystic duct and common bile duct, then you'll have adequate fat digestion and absorption without the gallbladder there. Mm -hmm. So these branches the tree don't plug into the top of the gallbladder that was the picture in my head they plug so into more like an appendix yes like a, res a reservoir yeah exactly it's just it's off to the side and it's not essential it's not an essential organ so dogs cope really well without a gallbladder cats too but it's very rare that we need to remove cats gallbladder okay uh, whilst the reason i chose this picture which has a dog version and a cat version is just to highlight the difference between the anatomy of the bile duct and pancreatic ducts in cats and dogs because we're talking about pancreatitis next fortnight or it's in a month actually um, and we're talking about biliary disease now and we know that cats get cholecystitis or cholangitis more commonly than dogs so the difference in anatomy here does anybody else want to describe this? Is anybody like really across this having just studied it and want to tell me all about it? Dogs have a pancreatic duct, which is separate, whereas cats don't have that. They just have the common thing that goes up. So then the bacteria can track back up ascendingly. Very good. It's exactly right. So on this picture, you can see that the dog and the, the dog pancreatic duct and bile duct are plugging into the duodenum right on top of each other. So this is the duodenal papilla here that we see on endoscopy or ultrasound. But there's actually two openings and there's two valves essentially. So it's if we've got bacteria just by chance making its way up the bile duct, it doesn't necessarily make its way up the pancreatic duct as well. Whereas in cats, you can see that the pancreatic duct actually plugs into the side of the bile duct and the bile duct then plugs into the duodenum. So any reflux bacteria from the duodenum into the bile duct can potentially impact the pancreas as well, which is why we see concurrent disease in the pancreas and gallbladder more commonly or one of the many reasons proposed um, that we see disease concurrently in the pancreas and gallbladder in cats. Does that make sense? Okay, stopping sharing. What was I dotted on um, on cats and solid on dogs? Sorry, so what was the first part of the question? What what was that? Was uh, dotted on. Um, oh, the accessory duct. Um, not all cats have them, so dogs have got a spare pancreatic duct that plugs in about two centimeters further down, um, whereas cats don't necessarily have that. Um, okay. Now, 
what clinical signs are we going to see if we have an obstruction to the flow of bile? Icterus. Uh-huh. Good. Is that all? Probably. Uh, lethargy. Yeah. So there's going to be some non-specific signs, probably some gastrointestinal signs. And then most of the signs are from the underlying cause of the biliary obstruction. What's the most common cause of biliary obstruction that we see? In dogs. In Oh, I got a mucosil and I got collidocolites, and neither of those are the most common. Pancreatitis. Yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. Just because pancreas pancreatitis happens all the time. Mm. Um, so looking at that diagram or thinking back to that diagram again, um, if you've got swelling in the pancreas and um, fibrosis particularly occurring as pancreatitis resolves, it's going to put pressure on the bile duct and cause usually a partial obstruction of bile flow. Um, I was really surprised that this is a really good paper. Fellowship candidates, write this down. It's, a, it's like a textbook. Um, it's from Vet Clinics in North America, 2009, a Sharon Centre paper on the biliary system. And um, it's, they've done research studies where they just tied off bile ducts and how long it takes for fibrosis to develop and like for permanent damage to develop. So you can have a bile duct completely obstructed for two weeks and have no permanent damage. Beyond two weeks, you get some permanent damage. Beyond six weeks, you develop fibrosis and cirrhosis, portal hypertension, right up through the, the liver as a result of the degree of cholestasis. So whilst our dogs with pancreatitis often have this transient partial extrahepatic biliary obstruction, we've got actually a fair bit of leeway as long as they're coping with the degree of hyperbilirubinemia to just kind of wait it out. And also as long as they're not about to rupture their gallbladder, that's a problem. How do you tell that? Is that just by the diameter of the gallbladder wall? Yeah, a diameter of the gallbladder itself, the um, changes surrounding the gallbladder as well. So if it's really inflamed looking and we've got some fluid around the gallbladder, I'd be really concerned. Um, but yes, essentially sequential daily ultrasound monitoring. Um, most of the time the bilirubin, I mean, we have seen them get really, 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 really high, but most of the time they're under 200 and the dogs clinically are improving from their pancreatitis by the time they get their obstruction. So they kind of have pancreatitis, get better, go home and start eating and then come back in yellow and stopped eating again. Um, has it, has that been other people's experience or would they say that you've seen that obstruction during the active pancreatitis? I've Sorry, never seen it. You've never seen it? Nor have I. I don't think. Hmm? Oh. Not for a few years. This is a reality check for me. I, I, I can't say that I've seen it either, but then again, you don't see things that you're not looking for often. Yeah. And I do think a lot of them in that kind of recovery phase from pancreatitis, their owners don't bring them back in. They want them at home. If they're still eating, they keep them at home. And there's probably a few dogs that get a little bit yellow and then go back to normal. Um, I think working in a critical care setting, you see more of these ones that need that sort of prolonged hospitalisation and, and things. So I'm probably a little bit skewed with how common this is. It is more common than collidocolis, so for sure. Um, should we talk about... Oh, I'm going to put the slides up. Is any, does anybody want to cover anything really specific in this discussion? No? Nope. With the rupture, just with the, the risk of rupture, you, you can't nicely correlate um, hyperbilirubinemia with um, risk of, obviously, the higher it is, it, like the higher it is, maybe the risk goes up a little bit, but there's not like a cut cut off where you uh, imminent rupture is going to be necessary. Like you, you need imaging. Yeah, no, the interesting Central thing imaging. in that study where they tied off the gallbladders, they didn't rupture. It was like two mm. out of 
like a big number that didn't, that ruptured and the vast majority didn't rupture. So the, the biggest problem was intrahepatic cholestasis, secondary sure, yeah. intrahepatic cholestasis, and then hepatocellular damage. Um, but there's no correlation with the bilirubin level. It's got to be on the basis of ultrasound findings. Right. And yeah, like you said, it's not a like a dead end um, bladder. It's uh, it's like got the, the the pressure can go back into the liver. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just a little sort of reservoir off the side, but uh, the pressure's in the whole system, and the liver's got a lot of capacity to to accommodate that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm going to see if I can share these slides. All right, bear with me. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so let's talk initially. Is anybody doing their own ultrasounds or watching ultrasound? Yep. You people, yeah. Um, so this talk is specifically about ultrasound. Uh, so the first thing I want to cover is actually the limitations of looking at the liver with ultrasound. Um, the liver is the biggest organ that we look at in the abdomen and particularly in large breed dogs over 25 kilos, they often have um, really, we have really reduced capacity to assess it thoroughly because of how deep it is and how far away we're sort of looking. Ultrasound's great. We get great resolution within that kind of five centimetre depth range. But once you get beyond that, you lose resolution and therefore you lose detail. So there's been studies showing that CT is far superior to ultrasound in detection of metastases in patients over 25 kilos. Um, so in humans, they don't, I mean, they use ultrasound a lot, obviously, but they use CT a lot more if they're looking for metastases and things because they're big animals. And I think the veterinary, where as availability of CT increases, the veterinary field will move towards that as well. Um, it's technically quite challenging to look at the liver. I don't know if anybody else finds that, but it hurts my shoulder. I've got to dig really hard to get a good look at the liver. Um, it's right up under the ribs in a lot of dogs and particularly narrow chested or deep chested dogs. Um, it's really hard to look at and you've got to look sort of through the ribs and up the sternum and things like that. Um, so uh, ultrasound is not a perfect way to assess the liver, particularly in large breed dogs. Um, when would you do radiographs to complement your ultrasound if you were in general practice, didn't have access to a CT? What sort of components of liver assessment might be better assessed by radiographs? A liver size, like if there's Good. a liver Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Presence Which is really gas. hard. We'll say again. Well, presence of gas as well would be quite yeah. helpful, I think. Absolutely. Mineral densities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's really hard to differentiate mineral from gas on ultrasound because they're both what colour? Hyperechoic with distal shadowing. Good. I shouldn't have said colour. Sorry. Yeah. Green. <laughs> 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 Green. <laughs> uh, yeah, so radiographs will really help you differentiate that. Um uh, so, yes, size and gas versus mineral. Perfect. Okay, so just a quick revision of the anatomy of where the gallbladder sits in the dog. So, the dog obviously head up, head up this end. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, so, the gallbladder is just to the right of midline. Um, so, often when I'm assessing the or assessing the liver, I start with my probe right just quarter to the sternum, so as cranial as you can get it and still be on the abdomen, and look straight up the middle of the liver. And usually I start on the gallbladder. And just as far as kind of hepatic anatomy, there's not many ultrasonographers who will aim to distinguish which lobes which with ultrasound because it's so flawed. You're wrong a lot of the time when you um, 
sort of think it's one lobe, it's often another lobe. Um, so don't worry too much about which lobes it is, but when you are ultrasounding the liver, go midline, middle of the liver, sorry, I should say, including the gallbladder, left liver and right liver. They're your kind of three segments that you want to kind of divide it up into your, in your brain and make sure that you're assessing all three of those parts um, through sort of fanning. So sometimes the liver's huge, you can't get it on one view and you've got to make sure you've gone through the whole thing. Um, Alex, do you have anything else to add to that technique-wise? No, I think, yeah, I'd see that's the same how all the radiologists do it too. Okay. <laughs> uh, you guys all know the indications for ultrasound, so I won't torture you with that. Um, so when I look at a liver, the four things that I'm just wanting to make sure that I've clocked in my head is how big is the liver, knowing that there's limited um, ability for ultrasound to detect that. How might you say, oh, this liver's big on ultrasound? What might you be looking for to be able to make that call? Um, if it extends beyond the costal chondral arc, but that's not always consistent. But if you can kind of put it straight at the xiphoid and you see um, liver and the caudal aspect of your um, image, then you might be more concerned about hepatomegaly. Excellent. Yeah. And what about the shape of the tips of the lobes? Like, what do you think about? <laughs> yeah. So when they're enlarged, when the liver's enlarged, the, they tend to get a little bit more rounded. Um, so size is the first thing. And then echogenicity of the liver. Again, this is not a sensitive test. You get sort of inklings on ultrasound, but it's it's subtle hyper or hypoechogenicity. You're going to miss it on ultrasound. How do you tell whether the liver's normal echogenicity or not? It should be hypoechoic to the spleen and isoechoic or hyperechoic to the renal cortex. Super. You told okay. me that enough. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm impressed. Um, so size, echogenicity, echo texture. So the three kind of things that I'm looking for is their nodules. Are there any mass lesions? Or is there any mineralization or gas? So as I'm scanning through the hepatic parenchyma, so this part, does it look a nice smooth grey or is it irregular? So nodular change, I say, usually coarse if their nodules are really subtle, but it just looks a bit rough. Or if there's proper nodules in there, then I'll measure them and, and call it a nodular change. A mass lesion is a change in echo texture. And obviously any mineral or anything is going to make it look not a smooth grey colour. So that's echo texture as well. And then the vasculature. So this image I've included here, you can see a hepatic vein here and a portal vein here. So all of the sections of the liver you look at, you should be seeing both portal and hepatic vasculature in each lobe. Um, when might we not see portal veins? If it's more hyperechoic, because then you, like it's, if the whole liver is diffusely hyperechoic, maybe. Yep, you might not see the, the bright walls. The portal veins have bright walls as opposed to hepatic veins that you can't see the walls very well. Can everybody um, appreciate that? Mm -hmm. Portal vein here, hepatic vein here. Yep. So if the liver is diffusely hyperechoic, it might be harder to differentiate portal from um, hepatic vein. When might you see just no portal vein? So just hepatic veins, no portal veins. Grunting. Grunting, good, exactly. Yeah, so if the portal system is hypovolemic, uh, then that's a significant finding. So if they're much smaller than hepatic veins, and it may indicate that blood blood's shunting directly from the portal vein proper into circulation and not perfusing the portal system in the liver. Um, now, shunts can be only in one lobe, particularly intrahepatic shunts. They can bypass the right liver only or the left liver only. So it's important to check the vasculature in both sides of the liver when you're looking, um, if particularly if you're looking for a shunt. Um, when might the hepatic veins be bigger than the portal veins? Con nice congestion, venous congestion. Good. Excellent. What causes that? Like right-sided heart failure, 
hypertension, portal hypertension. Cranial vena cava, um, sorry, cortical vena cava hypertension. Yeah, lovely. Um, okay, so I won't go through the kind of standard views that we get typically in the liver, um, except that it's really important to look down through the ribs as well as just up through the sternum so that you're getting the dorsal aspect of the liver. It's really hard to assess that from ventrally because you're looking so deep and you're losing resolution. Um, okay, let's move on to cases. So here we have a 12 year old male neutered Maltese with polyuria, polydipsia, pot belly, rat tail and elevated ALP. It's a really classic history, isn't it? Yep. Does somebody want to tell me about the liver that they're seeing in the image here? <clears throat> it's it's <clears throat> sorry, uh, hyperechoic. Uh, mm -hmm. There's there's less pattern to it than than um, normal too. Yeah, it's yeah. homogeneous. Yeah. Um, so I'm zoomed fairly far out in this image, so you can see it's sort of six centimeters out. Um, but I agree, it's hyperechoic. I can tell that because it's pretty isoechoic to the spleen when you sit them next door to each other. If we move on to the next image, same patient, next image. So I've got a picture of the left liver sitting right next to the spleen. Again, you can see that they're isoechoic. This is the tip of the liver lobe. What do you think about its shape? Rounded. It's rounded for sure. Now, what do you think of its echo texture? That one's mixed. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a little bit coarse, probably. So what I want to point out here, I'm at six centimetres depth and I'm using the highest frequency to look at this. And you sort of think, ah, oh, it's a little bit coarse. This is actually a mass and you can barely see it. It's really, really hard or your liver ultrasound sensitivity is really impacted by your resolution and image quality that you're getting. So this is a really superficial mass lesion and you can barely see it. So this is the same dog, same liver, and then zoomed in a little bit more with higher resolution in the near field, you can see more distinct nodules there. Can everyone see that? Yep. Yep. The hypoechoic nodules. Hypoechoic nodule, exactly. And then you kind of get the impression there's another one, there's another one, there's another one, there's another one. So this is a liver that I would describe as diffusely enlarged, hyperechoic with hypoechoic nodules. And then there's a focal, there was that focal mass lesion in the tip of one of the liver lobes. Um, this is a nine year old male neutered Sheltie with lethargy and ALT and ALP elevations. And the reason I put this um, picture in is just how different the nodules are compared to the Cushing's dog. That dog had Cushing's just in case she hadn't uh, appreciated that. Can you see the nodules in this liver even though it's a lower frequency image? A lower resolution image, I should say. Very, very obvious and very hypoechoic. There's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least nine mm -hmm. of them. Maybe on the on the bottom right, there's probably a lot more bigger mass. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I completely agree. So these I would describe as well-defined nodules, um, and they almost look like that one almost looks cystic. It's really, really hypoechoic. Um, now, the reason I put this in, I don't actually know what this dog had, um, but more well-defined nodules are less likely to be a metabolic hepatopathy. So if you see very dark nodules like this, it's usually a more aggressive process. So whether that's inflammatory or um, infectious neoplastic, um, more typical than a metabolic process. 
Um, now, this is a patient with who'd had a splenic hemangiosarcoma removed six months before. What do we think of these nodules? Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah. Um, they look like target lesions, which Ooh, means there's an eighty percent chance that they're um, metastatic. Good. Very good. Yeah. So eighty percent target lesions. Which Alex, do you mind describing what that means? Um, it's hyperechoic in the center of the lesion, surrounded by a hypoechoic rim. So it looks like a target. But yes, lovely. <laughs> so everyone can appreciate that. Just slightly more hyperechoic in the center, and then there's a hypoechoic rim around them. When you see that, um, the implication there is that they're um, very vascular and there's this sort of almost edematous ring around the process. And it's much more likely to be an aggressive process if you're seeing target morphology nodules. Um, so as Alex said, 80% chance of, I think it's of, of the process being neoplastic or malignant as opposed to metastatic. Uh, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I think you're right. I confuse my yeah. M words a lot. <laughs> I think so it's this, yeah. this is clearly a metastatic process because there's so many nodules but if I just saw one I, I wouldn't be confident to say that's not the primary um but yes in with his dog's history this is almost certainly a, a metastatic mandiosar what was the previous one metastatic as well oh the shelty yeah actually can't remember sorry mm. <laughs> But this this sort of nodules, it it could be easily be metastatic. It could easily be um, uh, like diffuse hepatocellular carcinoma potentially. Um, right. Could be hepatic cutaneous syndrome. Really well demarcated nodules like that. Mm -hmm. um, but usually a more aggressive process was the um, the sure. thing. Yep. So this is a two year old female new to desexed. Oh, sorry, a domestic short hair with acute onset of GIT signs, so profound GIT signs, like vomiting and profound hemorrhagic diarrhea, pyrexia, neutrophilia, and a hyperbilirubinemia. So this is the liver. You can see a hepatic vein in that lobe here. I'm gonna play it again. Does anyone wanna describe it to me while it plays? Um, there is hyperechoic linear material causing distal acoustic shadowing um, and it's very heterogeneous mm -hmm. like the parenchyma appears heterogeneous um, mm. I'd be worried about mineral or gas good and the fact hey, that pyrexic is probably gas hey if it's like an abscess yes. or something yeah I and mean, this is diffuse throughout the whole liver oh okay um so <laughs> Cystitis, um, sorry, cholecystitis, that kind of thing. FIP. Oh, FIP is an interesting um, option. I don't know how FIP would cause gas, though, or mineral. I guess it would cause yeah. yeah. mineral if it was chronic. Because it would be, um, it'd be like cl clostridium or E. coli. Yeah, good. Gas forming organisms, exactly. Um, so, Particularly with this acute onset of signs, gas would be my leading differential, but I can't differentiate gas from mineral on the basis of the ultrasound. So what am I going to do? Red. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Good, exactly. Um, so the key thing in this case is that, um, how acute the signs are. So mineral takes time to develop. So we're, you can see mineral with chronic inflammation. So this cat could potentially have had a really chronic cholangiohepatitis or cholangitis and mineral throughout all the biliary structures within its liver and then have just got an E. coli in there that was particularly um, pathogenic and developed pyrexia and things. So that's one differential. We can't rule that out. Um, but certainly gas, uh, emphysematous cholangitis would be my leading differential in this, this cat. Um, so you're just some radiation. This wouldn't be as echogenic as that, uh, would it? Be your pardon, say again. Fibrosis wouldn't be as echogenic as that. Yeah, you're right, exactly. So fibrosis would typically be more within the parenchyma. So we've sort of got some pretty normal looking parenchyma there and fibrosis tends to be kind of affecting the whole liver and it's at a microscopic level. So the whole liver just looks kind of bright 
a little bit heterogeneous and small, um, which didn't quite fit with this cat. And it wouldn't be that quite that bright. It shouldn't well, shadow. Did that cat survive? It did, actually. Um, so I wish I'd put these in this. Um, we did radiographs on this cat and it had actually portal venous gas. Um, so the mechanism of that is when you get profound necrosis of the mucosa, the gastrointestinal mucosa, and gas from the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract goes into the portal vein mm. and then spreads out through the limer. So oh. it's quite a spectacular pneumogram of the portal system in the liver in this cat. Um, but we would see this similarly with a um, emphysema just cholangitis, that portal gas is like reported in two cats liver. So it's unlikely. But yeah, similar picture in emphysema just cholangitis, but because bile flows from the periphery of the liver into the gallbladder, the gas is concentrated in the gallbladder as opposed to with portal gas, it's being distributed peripherally. So it's quite evenly distributed throughout the liver. Make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this cat did recover, but it was back in the day that everything with hemorrhagic gastro got metronidazole. Um, so I'm not sure it would have survived if it hadn't had metronidazole because it's almost certainly clostridial. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is an eight-year-old male neutered golden retriever who's presented with lethargy and collapse. What can you tell me about these liver images? Some free fluid. Oh, Over there. Mm -hmm. And there. Look. The padding veins look distended as well. I would say. Yeah. I w wasn't sure whether you could. Yeah, that's very hard to say just from a still image that you sort of get the impression when you're moving through the liver going, oh, they're taking up too much space in there. Um, but there's no measurements on here or anything. So, yes, I, the hepatic veins were congested. So we've got free fluid and we've got hepatic venous congestion. Around it is, it, it's, it probably is too um, homogenous, the echo texture. Mm -hmm. Good. So what are we going to do next? E echo. Yeah, good. Exactly. So even just the TFAST. So what's the most common cause of this sudden onset of... Um, Pre, uh, post hepatic congestion. Right sided heart failure. Yeah, or pericardial effusion. Mm. Yeah, Tampanite. particularly the sudden onset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and gold retriever. It's starting to, sarcoma. Yeah, exactly. Starting to get a bit nerve wracking. So, certainly echo and having a look for mass lesions on the heart there. Same dog. Sorry, that was just showing the fluid. Um, so, what I wanted to put this in is just to show four different images of the liver and we sort of say oh those look like aggressive nodules and those look like normal you know not so aggressive nodules um, but you can see here this liver is really subtly affected and it's lymphoma it's an aggressive process this liver you can barely see this mass lesion it's a hepatocellular carcinoma this one's a metastatic adenocarcinoma and again it's just causing a little bit of bulging of the capsule barely differentiated from surrounding liver. And then we've got this sort of big mass here, which looks exactly the same as these two, no more aggressive, no less aggressive, and it's completely benign nodular hyperplasia. So ultrasound is quite flawed in how it sort of, um, how lesions show up. And whilst we can sort of look at a lesion and say, well, about a celiac carcinoma is the most common thing we see causing this, but that's just on odds. It doesn't work. So it's always always good to do an aspirate or a biopsy. Okay, moving on to the gallbladder, which we're supposed to be talking about, but I hadn't shown any imaging stuff for the liver, so I thought we would go through that. Um, uh, so when I'm looking at the gallbladder, I'm essentially looking at the lumen and the wall. That's pretty much it. And then if there's any changes in the lumen and the wall, I'm going to think, okay, could this possibly be a mucosal? 
and I'm going to look for corresponding or correlating changes around the gallbladder to tell me whether there's evidence of an active inflammatory process, so little bits of fluid or hyperechoic fat, um, or whether the surrounds of the gallbladder look really quiet and I might be looking at something, some mineralization of the wall, for example, that might have happened three years before and not actually be a current problem. All right, so looking at this, what does this look like? That could be smudge. Uh, you need Good. to move the dog to see if it moves. Excellent. So this is gravity dependent. So when we rolled the dog over, all of that echogenic material just flopped down to the other side. What do you think about the gallbladder wall? This is this is this is artifact. Ignore this part. But gallbladder wall over this side. Normal. It's normal. Normal. Good. Um, so there was no markers of active inflammation in this soil, no thickening of the wall, no hyperechoic surrounds. Um, so would you call this normal or abnormal, that degree of sludging with no other changes? Normal. 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 Good. What about this 12-year-old malnutrition schnauzer who's presented with signs of acute hepatopathy with a marked ALP elevation and a mild total belly ribbon elevation? Colorless. Colorless. Great. What causes colorless in dogs? In a schnauzer, probably cholesterol, triglycerides. Good. Excellent. So hypercholesterolemia is one of the causes of colorless um, and therefore hypertriglyceridemia because that increases um, fat metabolism to cholesterol. Um, what do you think about the wall of the gallbladder here? It, it's hyperechoic, so it's... it's... Mm. I agree. Do you think it's thickened? I know there's no measurement there. Perhaps if not thickened, it's um, fibrotic. Mm, it's prominent for sure. The gallbladder walls, you shouldn't really be able to measure. They should be less than one millimetre, and I reckon I could measure that for sure. It's going to be over a millimetre. Um, so this dog didn't have a extra hepatic biliary obstruction. So those stones were all in the gallbladder and not in the bile duct, according to me. Um, does anyone know what the sensitivity is of actually detecting colorless in the bile duct is? Probably low. It's really low. So they're only, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not that low, but I would have thought if I see a gallbladder like that, I'm looking for the bile duct and I'm going to find the duodenal papilla and I'm going to find the neck of the gallbladder and I'm going to try and join them up to really look for them. Um, but uh, colorless are only found in 70% of cases that went to surgery. The colorless in the bile duct are only found in 70% of cases that went to surgery. So 30% were undetected and that was just a nice surprise at surgery. Um, so ultrasound is not a great tool because this, when this area is inflamed, the fat gets really bright around that bile duct and it can be really hard to see a very small collar lift, which might be causing very significant pathology. What other signs might we be able to look for that might indicate some biliary obstruction on ultrasound? On bile duct dilation. Good. How big? Um, greater than five millimetres, I think we start worrying about obstruction. Good, excellent. I um, mean, definitely, I think it's dogs. We shouldn't be seeing it at all, but cat or is it the other way around? I always forget. That's right. Um, so, dogs, the bile ducts is usually invisible. Uh, if you can see it, it's significant, and you should mention it in your report. Um, cats, it's allowed to be up to three millimeters um, before it just says kind of variant of normal. Um, Greater than five millimetres in either species is consistent with a obstruction um, between sort of three and five in cats. I'm going, eh, is it inflamed and maybe a bit flaccid like an esophagus when it gets inflamed and just not kind of maintaining the tone it should. Um, but, yeah, three to five is a bit of a grey zone in cats. All right, so this is a two-year-old male neutered cavoodle who has presented with an acute onset of vomiting and collapse. What does this gallbladder look like? Very 
I'm Sorry, free I... Fluid. <clears throat> I think it has a thickened wall and there's free, some free fluid around it as well. So it's inflamed. Cool, good. Free fluid. I think you probably need more information to say whether that fluid's free or in the wall. Mm -hmm. um, I heard somebody say edema. Call yeah. that a wall edema? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like the middle wall, the middle, sorry, the middle layer of the gallbladder is hypoechoic, um, mm -hmm. which looks like gallbladder wall edema. Yeah. It looks like a steak emoji to me. Like a what? Steak emoji? It does too. T bone. Uh, um so i i know uh, ultrasound is so flawed when you're looking at still images ultrasound is just impossible to interpret so i appreciate that um i'm asking you to interpret things that you'd never be interpreting without context when you're on your own um but this is gallbladder wall edema so you can see the three layers gallbladder wall is trilaminar one, two, three, and you should never see that it's trilaminar on ultrasound. Uh, so this sort of cent central black part is called is gallbladder wall edema. What is the most common cause of gallbladder wall edema? Anaphylaxis. Good, excellent. So it's one of the hallmarks of an anaphylactic response, and particularly with this very acute onset vomiting and collapse, it's the classic sort of anaphylaxis response. Um, presentation so in this case i'd probably say almost certainly anaphylaxis um what else might call that a wall edema be associated with ingestion as well so mm -hmm. all your right heart right sided heart failure causes um and yep. i think sepsis is another one yes good. i think we're talking about and alex might remember this but like i think uh, we were talking about even adverse reactions to things like dexmedetomidine as well could can cause it. I'm not sure if it's an adverse reaction, but metatomidine and dexmedetomidine gallbladder wall edema is reported in, but I think it might be congestion. Because you know how you get sort of um, venous stasis with like decreased, decreased cardiac output because of the profound bradycardia? So you get stasis because of the increased interval between venous returns. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the mechanism, but certainly metatermidine sedation. Uh, I would never expect, like it might be really subtle with metatermidine sedation. It shouldn't look like that. This is a this is an anaphylaxis response. Um, there's one other differential that might be associated with gallbladder wall edema, but it might look more like, this. So can you see that black layer yeah. there? Like a so cystitis. Called, yeah, exactly. So there's definitely called about a wall edema there. But why does that look different from the one before? What what other things would you write in your report? A regularly marginated wall. Good. Mm -hmm. Hyperechoic. Good. Yeah. And I've measured it there, but then I've cropped the measurement, but I reckon it was over three millimetres. Almost said, really, they call that a wall, isn't it? Yeah, it's really, um, I would say, irregular or coarse. That could, be, could that be biliary neoplasia as well? Um, that's such a good question. I, In theory, yes, but biliary neoplasia is almost always massive, as in mm -hmm. not, not enormous massive, but... Like a focal mass lesion, right? So it's the very more is more inflamed. So in this still image, theoretically, that could be a mass lesion. But if I looked at the whole, the whole gallbladder looked like this. So if I looked at that on ultrasound, I'd say it's not neoplastic; it's inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, and this dog has a little bit more of a chronic history um, than the last dog, which was a sort of two-hour history of um, very acute. Um, onset gastrointestinal signs, whereas this one it has been sicker for sort of 24 hours, and we're seeing some very bright gallbladder wall there. Um, this dog responded well to treatment. We didn't aspirate the gallbladder. Um, does anybody aspirate gallbladders? It's a bit of a risky business, but I it's, some people do it, I believe. Yeah. Um, so where I did my training, we aspirated all the gallbladders that looked abnormal, basically, um, and I never saw a complication at all. 
you know, as ultrasounding myself, a, a clinic had booked myself and Graham Allen, who's the world's best ultrasonographer, um, in to do an ultrasound on two separate animals at the same time. And I said something, oh, look, all that was abnormal. We should aspirate that. And he sort of looked at me like I was mad and said, don't do that in general practice. Um, and I was like, why? Nothing ever happens. And he said, until it does. And then it's a disaster. Um, and it was such a, like, you know, he's been such a mentor and such an influential person in ultrasound in Australia that now I don't aspirate all that as in general practice and I only do it in very controlled situations. Um, looking at the literature around that rather than the anecdotal stories from Graham Allen, um, there's a study, that I think it was like 120 patients who had their gallbladder aspirated and I think two ruptured. Um, so it's not as high risk as it could be. And the ones that ruptured um, had very, very inflamed gallbladder walls already and there was probably a degree of fragility to the gallbladder wall. Um, so if I do aspirate a gallbladder, I usually don't do it in the very, very inflamed looking ones and I try and empty out the entire gallbladder so I'm not leaving any pressure in there so I'm not less likely to get leaking from the gallbladder wall. Um, wow, I didn't so know. You're left just guessing if you've got um, infection in there now. That... I know, it responded to treatment for bacterial colander hepatitis. Okay. Yeah, so we wow. treated the dog with clav and liver support and he developed a she, Betty Pan, developed a pyrexia initially and then um, responded to antibiotics. And white cell count came down as well. So I'm pretty sure it was a bacterial gland hip. Anna, if you're not aspirating, mm -hmm. so if you're not doing culture and sensitivity, would you mm -hmm. just put these guys on amoxiclav or would you do amoxiclav and metronidazole? I usually just do amoxiclav because it gets into the bile quite well. Um, uh, amoxicillin has. Um, clostridial coverage so you're kind of doubling up with the metronidazole um, if I saw an abscess then I would use like where I thought there was going to be poor perfusion then I would use metronidazole for sure because it penetrates anaerobic areas better mm. than clav does the one thing that I would potentially add if the pyrexia hadn't broken within 12, 24 hours is potentially fluoroquinolone or something mm. more specific for E. coli because that's actually the most common bug we see in gallbladders um, amoxiclav has some spectrum over E. coli, but it's not great. And if they're really pyrexic, really neutrophilic and, and showing signs of sepsis, then I would add in for a Yep, thank you. Um, so this patient is a 10-year-old border terrier who has vomiting and abdominal pain. It's such a crap photo. Sorry, this one hasn't shown up very well. This is a mucosil. Sorry. <laughs> Um, the parts I'll highlight are this really hypoechoic thickened wall. Can everybody sort of see that? Yeah, that part's a bit clearer. Yeah. And instead of it being um, anechoic bile within the lumen, we've got this really hyperechoic bile in the lumen. And when you're rolling this dog around, this bile is not liquid. There's no kind of movement in it. We've got a really solid mass of inspissated bile and irregularly thickened gallbladder wall. Um, I've got to find a better picture of a mucosil for you. Um, but what we normally see if the mucosil is the problem in this dog is hyperechoic fat surrounding the gallbladder. Do we see fluid with mucosils? Yeah. If we see fluid. Wouldn't you worry about rupture if there's fluid? Like if you saw some fluid, then like that would be, it's not diagnostic, but you would con like you would be concerned that they, it may have ruptured. Yeah. Um, it's certainly for fluid, I'd be really worried. Gall gallbladder mucosils rupture, they almost always have ruptured at the time of surgery, regardless of what they look like on ultrasound. And the blood bilirubin level is more indicative of whether there's gallbladder wall necrosis and rupture than the presence of fluid on ultrasound, which I thought is interesting. Have I worded that in a way that makes sense? So Probably, but I still don't understand. <laughs> the gallbladder mucosils are solid. It's like a rock in there. There's no fluid to leak out of there. So you get gallbladder rupture, but you actually don't get fluid accumulating. You get very hyperechoic and reactive fat around it. 
but when it ruptures, it doesn't necessarily create fluid. So what you see is increased bilirubin in circulation, and that's evident on your blood tests, but you don't necessarily see fluid on the ultrasound. Does that make sense now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't you get some peritonitis? Like yeah, the fluid is actually the peritonite is not so much the bile actually. Yeah, exactly. So you'll get reactive fat before you get fluid. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so when you've got fluid as well, they're really bad and they've got a worse prognosis and the um, outcomes of surgery are, are more, um, are worse. What are the triggers of uh, mucosal formation? Um, like the, the risks, the general risks. Yeah, ri sorry, yeah, risk factors. Like um, dyslipidemias. Good. Uh, bile stasis. Good. Uh, breed would be one as well. So like your mm -hmm. shell teats are a big one with the um, gene mutation. Yeah. Um, endocrinopathies. Good. There's a really good paper that looks at medications associated with gallbladder formation. And thyroxin is number one. Um, uh, trilostane is number two. So that's a sort of a, it's not that the medications cause the mucosal, it's that the underlying conditions are associated with mucosal. And number three in Shelby specifically was imidacloprid. So there's, there's some sort of proposed mechanism of that in this paper, which is a bit wild, but Shelby's are carriers of the, um, uh, MDR P glycoprotein mutation and there's some theory that that mutation also contributes to decreased ability to process mus mucin or mucus and therefore they get this mucinous hyperplasia and gallbladder wall hypomotility and they can't squeeze their gallbladder and therefore the bile gets really solid in there so it's a little bit of a, a theory, which I thought was very interesting, but it's associated with imidacloprid use for some reason. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it it that, that it suggests that even well-stabilised animals on trilostane or thyroxin get it because they're no longer suffering from their hypothyroidism or their Cushing's because they're medicated. Um, yes. We rarely control them to the same level as a normal dog. So yeah, there's still, it's going to be a bit variable. Exactly. And there's been a period before they were diagnosed where there's been profound sort of hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia associated with both Cushing's and um, hypothyroidism. Um, we better wrap up. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Thank you. No Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Anna. And uh, look, a simple question, if I might. Um, sure. Using the cytosol <laughs> versus straight penicillin in... Um, I guess, form our clostridial diseases. What's your comment? Mm -hmm. um, metronidazole versus straight penicillin. Depends where the infection is. So I'll always use metronidazole if I think it's an area that metronidazole will penetrate better than amoxicillin or penicillin. Um, but in theory, in a Petri dish, both have equal effect against clostridia. So where my choice of antibiotics is going to be more dependent on the location. If it's an abscess, metronidazole. If it's an area that doesn't get a huge blood flow, like a joint or something like that, metronidazole. Um, if it's a necrotic wound, metronidazole. But if it's in a lung, amoxicillin or ampicillin or penicillin. Tetracycline is better in lungs though, isn't it? Doesn't that penetrate lungs better? doesn't have great clostridial coverage though. And really, it's got to be a pretty brave clostridial organism to get into a lung, yeah. like the most oxygen you can get. <laughs> it's not going to do well in there. Uh, it's not until that lung node's quite necrotic and abscessed that you need metronidazole. Okay, thank you. And thanks once again. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.